Hello and welcome to this overview of historical romance new releases that I read that were published in April of 2023. I'm Olivia, your favorite resource for book recommendations you can easily screenshot, and you're watching Random Olive Reads. First up is Romancing the Heiress by Darcy Burke, which is book three of the Lords in Love series. Leah is back in Merrywell for the annual matchmaking festival as a companion to a young debutante in search of a husband. Of course, Leah is still enamored with her childhood friend Phineas, who is considering marrying an heiress to save his secretly impoverished estate. This one is a relatively quick read with somewhat tragic backstories for everyone involved. Leah had an abusive childhood, so she was desperate to escape the village of Merrywell. Phineas had a gambling father who left the estate in dire financial condition. And even the young debutante, who is not at all con someone we're concerned with, has an overbearing and managing mother. However, the attraction between Leah and Phineas was a delight to read, and their shared history made for a stronger connection. And we get to see the couple from book one of the series again here in town for the festival. Next up is Rogue Awakening by Kara Maxwell. It is book four of the Wicked Widows League series. Sylvia is recently out of mourning for her much older husband of a decade and is ready to join the Wicked Widows. She's at a ball looking for a gentleman to take to bed, and she settles on her younger brother's best friend Jasper, who has recently returned to England. Now, Jasper has been in love with Sylvia for many, many years and is hoping that this is the beginning of a courtship and marriage, but Sylvia doesn't want to give up her freedom now that she's a widow. This is a novella-length book that's a pretty quick and steamy read, and the conflict does ultimately get wrapped up in short order. Surrendering to the Duke by Stevie Sparks is an interwar-era um, England book, which is also book one of the Lords of Desire series. Now, interwar-era means that it takes place after the Great War or World War I. Content warnings galore in this one for violence, post-war substance abuse, and history of sexual assault. We have a duke's widow, Emmeline, living with her late husband's family with her young daughter, with a history of abuse at the hand of her uncle who raised her after she was orphaned at the age of three. I told you, content warnings. Michael, her late husband's younger brother, and now Duke, is back at home after completing his war-related duties after the Great War. His mother suggests that he marry Emmeline to provide her with more children and provide the dukedom with an heir. Of course, Michael had been in love with Emmeline since he first saw her, but has had extreme guilt over coveting his brother's wife. These two embark on a courtship of convenience with the possible goal of marriage, but both have secrets and traumas that may prevent them from living happily ever after. Loads of drama in this book, all the angst, and we find out some dirty little secrets of Emmeline's late husband. It's an excellent read. Next, I read Return to Satterthwaite Court by Mimi Matthews. It is book three of the Somerset Stories series. Take the son from the couple of book one of the series and the daughter of the couple from book two of the series, throw them together, and you get book three. Kate and Charles have a chance meeting in a London street when Charles rescues a stray dog, much like his mother would do, and Kate finds herself completely enthralled and ready to pursue him. Kate has been uninterested in any of the other gentlemen she's met this year, and Charles is newly returned from serving in the Navy. The romance here is pretty straightforward, and we get to revisit the families we loved from the previous books. Plus, there is a nice setup for book four, which comes out later this year. To Swoon and to Spar by Martha Waters is book four of the Regency Vows series. Viscount Penvale, older brother to Diana from book two of the series, has finally gotten the opportunity to purchase his family's estate back from his uncle, but in order to do so, he needs to marry his uncle's ward, Jane, as part of the deal. Jane is socially awkward and kind of sharp, so Penvale's group of happily married friends are all skeptical of the union. After the arranged marriage takes place, and Penvale and Jane are back at the estate, she starts to enact her crazy plan of haunting the castle to drive Penvale away. 
Jane thinks he'll just go back to his life in London, leaving her alone in this seaside estate just like she wants. This one is definitely a slow burn towards friendship and then love with lots of humor as Penville figures out pretty quickly that Jane is the culprit of the ghost and haunting. And then we get to see everyone back together for a house party towards the end of the book. A Beginner's Guide to Scandal by Olivia Fleur is book one of the Tales from Honeysuckle Street series. Childhood friends and neighbors Iris and Hamish are separated when Hamish suddenly becomes the heir to an earldom, losing his mother and older brother in a carriage accident. When Hamish returns to town 12 years later, he has been instructed by his overbearing father to find a suitable wife, but he plans to thwart his father's plan and create a scandal instead. Meanwhile, Iris has been assisting with her father's merchant company, traveling the world and learning the business for the past decade. However, her father's mental state has been declining for many years, and Iris has been keeping it a secret and doing his work for him. As Hamish and Iris reunite, they have to deal with her heartbreak after he left, their differences in social station, and her need to stay proper so the board of directors of her father's company will approve her joining the leadership team. It's a huge mess of competing interests, and Hamish is mostly an idiot throughout the book. I did enjoy reading all about the quirky neighbors on the street and looking forward to reading more from this series. Two Scandals and a Scot by Tracy Sumner is book five of the Duchess Society series. Theo runs away from her pre-wedding ball when her fiancé's pregnant mistress shows up. Of course, she gets into the carriage of Dash, the friend she helped learn to read and write so that he could publish his book of gambling cheats. When he realizes that she's run away from her duke of a brother-in-law's house, he chases after her. Of course, they cause an even bigger scandal when they're at a country inn on the road and pretty much forced to marry when Theo's family catches up to them. Since the two are friends who are very much attracted to each other, Theo proposes that they stay friends with their own independence, not to fall prey to the obsessive love that surrounds the other couples in their social sphere, basically all the other couples from the earlier books in the series, and so they make an agreement. Bargain made, they go into their marriage and settle into their new life a bit, trying so very hard not to involve their emotions, which goes exactly how you'd expect it to go if you're a frequent romance reader. I really enjoyed reading this book and learning more about Dash's background, how he basically worships Theo, and her strength and stubbornness that most people underestimate. Defying the Earl by Erica Ridley is book four of the Lords in Love series. Titus is the grumpiest Earl you ever did meet, eschewing all social niceties and events. He is tasked by his godmother to take on a 20-year-old ward and comes to the Marywell Festival to meet her. But before he can do that, he is kissed by a stranger behind the potted plants at the assembly, and then he's totally aghast to realize that he has kissed his ward Matilda. She's recently out of mourning from her parents, um, nearly reaching her majority and inheritance, and wants to socialize and make friends with people because of the isolated way that she's been living her life recently. This one is very much a grumpy sunshine story with tragic backstories for both Titus and Matilda, but they differ greatly in the way that they've moved on from their respective tragedies. This one was another fun and quick read from this series. The Enemy of My Enemy is My Lover by Cassandra Moran. The author here has said that this will be book one of a series involving the Martian family, but no official series title is available right now. We start at a ball at the Viscount Marston's London home, where Samira is a young woman crashing the ball to steal loose cash and trinkets from the Lord's study. Rowan, the Viscount, dislikes balls and soirees, but is captivated by Samira's appearance, so he follows her to his own study and doesn't quite reveal that he is the Lord of the house. After stealing a kiss from her, he calls her out on her thievery and then lets her go. 
The next day, Rowan calls upon Samira at her home to ask for her assistance in stealing incriminating letters away from a slimy Earl. Since Samira has her own grudge against that Earl, she agrees. The story continuously deals with Rowan and Samira's attraction for each other, his need to uphold his duties and reputation, and her insistence to never become a man's mistress. Both characters need to open themselves to trust each other and their intentions, and they're both terribly stubborn. I especially liked learning about Samira's backstory and how she grew to be so skeptical of the men of society. It's interesting to see the family dynamics of both of their respective families and how the stage is set for future books in the series. The Lady Knows Best by Susanna Craig is book one of the Good's Guide to Misconduct series. There is a prequel novella that comes before this one, so I highly recommend reading that one first. Anyway, Daphne stumbles upon a meeting of the anonymous writers of a forward-thinking women's magazine and somehow gets assigned the task of writing a reply to a young lady asking what to do after catching her arranged fiancé with another woman. Miles, a terribly rakish Viscount, ends up the victim of the advice column when his fiancé calls off the engagement. He soon realizes that Daphne is the anonymous authoress and blackmails her into finding him a suitable replacement or else he'll expose her writing. Meanwhile, her mentor at the magazine encourages her to write an essay about troublesome rakes and use the attentions of the Viscount as research. Daphne offers herself up for marriage, mostly to gather research about Miles until he calls it off, but also because she's attracted to him. Over the course of the book, we find that Miles is more than what he seems, and we're just waiting for Daphne to realize it too. It's a fun setup for the series, and also a nice callback to Daphne's older siblings, who are main characters of some of Susanna Craig's previous books. How Not to Marry a Duke by Tina Gabrielle is book two of the Daring Ladies series. We follow the Duke friend from book one here about a year after that book ends into the country where he is working on his inventions. The Duke of Warwick, known to his sweet godmother as Daniel, is not your typical Duke. He is socially inept and awkward and focuses mostly on his passion for science and technology. While hiding in the country to escape the bustle of town and the matchmaking efforts of his godmother, he meets his new neighbor, Adeline, who has her own problems. Adeline is the banished half-sister of an earl who is in the country to work as the village healer. However, her brother has tried to arrange her marriage to a moneylender to pay off his debts. When Warwick overhears the argument between Adeline and her brother, he steps in and says she cannot marry another person because they're courting. We start a fake courtship here so that Warwick can avoid his godmother's pressure to marry and so that Adeline can avoid her brother's arranged betrothal. Both characters are preoccupied with their own individual goals, definitely not looking to marry, especially not to each other. Of course, as they spend more time with each other, they learn to appreciate each other's strengths, even if those strengths are typically dismissed by society. I especially loved how Warwick was supportive of Adeline's work as a healer. The romance built up slowly in this book, but the respect they had for each other was a strong foundation for their partnership. A Rogue's Rules for Seduction by Eva Lee is book three of the Last Chance Scoundrel series. It has been nearly a year since Dom abandoned Willa at the altar, and his friends and her brothers, Kieran and Finn, have conspired to bring them both to the same isolated island house party in Scotland. Dom and Willa have to finally talk out their issues if they have any hope of moving on. We quickly see that while they were courting and engaged, each were playing a bit of a role and enjoyed the shock value of the other person's status rather than the person they truly were. From dock worker to wealthy son of a shipping magnate, Dom has been considered an outsider to the aristocracy. Willa, daughter of an earl, has been brash and outrageous and has delighted in shocking the town with her brutish suitor. Likewise, Dom viewed Willa as this unattainable prize. He first felt proud to court and then felt guilty that he was so far below her standing, ultimately leading to his abandonment. Now that they're in the same place again, they start to realize that they 
treated each other superficially in their courtship and engagement, and that a marriage at that time would have been unhappy. But the spark and attraction continues to exist between them, and now that they're being more honest with each other, they're starting to give in to those desires, even if they're not quite willing to risk their hearts yet. How to Best a Marquess by Yana McGregor is book three of the Widow Rules series. The prologue here consists of a very charming proposal from Julian to Beth, but things didn't quite turn out the way they expected. Eight years later, Beth is now one of three widows to a duke's younger brother and was not in fact married to the scoundrel at all. In a quest to recover her lost dowry and to get away from her older brother's influence, she seeks out the destitute Julian, now a, now a Marquess, for assistance, offering half the money in payment. We follow with a road trip and second chance romance, though Beth is adamant that she never marry, and she knows that her reputation will be detrimental to the Honorable Julian's reputation. Julian just wants to convince Beth that he's sorry for walking away from her all those years ago when her brother denied his proposal and that he's still in love with her. I mostly empathize with poor Julian here who just can't catch a break. And of course, all of those road trip adventures are fun to read as well. Thank you so much for watching this video. Links to all the books are in the description box. Like and subscribe so you don't miss future videos. And you can follow me on Instagram at randomolive.